All right, why don't we get started? So um, welcome everybody, I'm John Conway. I'm the owner of 2015 Visioneers. Uh, and today we are going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the scientific informatics of biology and biopharma and biomaterials. Um, we have an incredible panel today. Um, so I wanna do the introductions. So uh, Nitty is from Gilead Sciences, is an, an inclusive, an empathetic R&D IT leader. Uh, Nidhi has worked in uh, different capacity, capacities over the year and she does a great job at what she does. Uh, Yan Ping is at Regeneron and she's a director of business analysis. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with both Nidhi and Yan Ping in the past uh, and uh, they're, they're both stellar uh, performers and people. Andrew, Andrew LeBeau, is the Associate Vice President of Marketing of Biology at Dotmatics. And again, I've worked with Andrew in the past and an, another uh, great person. Shatora is at Accent Therapeutics and he's a senior manager uh, for them. And again, I've worked with Shatora as well. I've worked with everybody. Um, and uh, great guy and very knowledgeable uh, about the uh, scientific informatics environment. Um, in startup and pharma. Josh Lickman is an associate director of bioinformatics at EdGM Biopharmaceuticals. Uh, and uh, I actually have not worked with Josh in the past, um, but just from the past couple of days of speaking with him, I'm very knowledgeable. And then last but not least, Mike Cabal from Bluebee. Mike is the head of uh, application science at uh, Bluebee. Uh, and our two speakers today will be uh, Andrew Lebeau and Mike Cabal. Uh, we're also going to hear from our panelists um, on some things that they want to present and also answering any questions that you may have from startup to large biopharmaceutical company uh, in the domain of scientific informatics and biology. So with that, uh, we'll get started. I did the introductions. I'm going to give a couple slides on some background. Uh, my background is in this space. I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, now I'm consulting for a lot of different companies right now um, and having a lot of fun. We'll have a presentation from Dotmatics. We'll have a presentation from Bluebee. And then again, you'll get to hear from the panelists and answer any questions uh, that you may have. There's a Q&A box. Uh, uh, with Zoom, if you want to use that, some people use the chat, but if you use the Q&A, it's easy to kind of go through and, and answer all your questions. Sometimes we get a lot of questions. So let's get started. So the biology of drug discovery, it's, it's fair to say it's exploding. It's also fair to say it exploded. So um, from target identification through hit identification, through lead optimization, preclinical and clinical, there is just a ton of work that goes on and a ton of data types, ton of processes, and it's getting very, very difficult to keep it all straight. Um, and there are different modes here as well. There are modes of small molecule, there's large molecule, um, and, and then ancillary things that, that come with those. Um, just be aware that whether you're doing biological screening or um, doing antibody work or whatever it may be, at some point, a lot of this data needs to get tied together for people to make bigger and better decisions. And that's really what scientific informatics is all about, being able to capture this with contextualization and, and ultimately reuse it. Because it's, uh, if you've seen other webinars, it's, um, it, you know, data it has high value, and it, it's no different than money or a, diff a form of currency. So when you're trying to discover that new molecular entity, it starts with ideas, so that the process of ideation actually gets influence from the content that's out there and any virtual type of experimentation that's going on. Then you start to design and this is, this is the point of using experimental design tools, electronic laboratory notebooks, request management, sample management, entity registration, et cetera. This is, this is all critical. 
but as you get into synthesis mode, you start to use maybe some less tools. Maybe you're using an ELN and a LIMS environment, depending on where you're at in research. Um, you're using request management. You'll notice that I, I mentioned request management many times here. It is really a, a critical thing in, in uh, larger pharmas today to be able to manage something from the time of request because everything starts with the request all the way through. And then characterization and screening. Again, all this uh, biology is critical. Um, and then again, you come back to your electronic lab notebooks, your decision support tools, your exploratory analysis. And this is, this is where things are starting to really happen in the multi-omic space. And that's why I had Dotmatics and Bluebe come to the uh, forum today, is because the multi-omics is really taking off, but really needs a lot of work to get it all organized and managed. And, and to, to take advantage of that knowledge. That, that knowledge environment that you need at the end to make better decisions. So I just wanted to go through a couple things just to kind of ground everyone. You know, the role of the next generation ELN. Um, the new ELNs are not what, um, you know, our predecessors used. They're far much more advanced and the, the capabilities are, are coming day by day. So even though I'm calling it the next generation, a lot of them are actually starting to be here now. But the, the role of an ELN is critical in uh, medium and large biopharmas. They should, they should be used in, in all industrialized science, um, but it's really to capture unstructured approaches. They need to be scientifically aware and they really need to capture the scientific method. They need to be highly usable and functional, which is configurable. And every change can't be a special project. So this is, this is a really important piece. Um, what would be great is if they can start tracking researchers in the labs on what they're doing um, and, and to require less and less interaction uh, with these tools. Another advantage, another opportunity there is something what Lab Voice is offering, where if you think of Jarvis in Iron Man, right? He was their virtual assistant, or he was Iron Man's virtual assistant. It sounds kind of funny or far fetched, but it's actually not, and it's coming, right? It's going to be here in the next several years, I think. Um, very prevalently. So the last, the last couple of things is it needs to be very detail oriented. So not only do you, are you going to need to start capturing your processes with detail, but the data that comes along with that so that the data and the processes become findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, you're going to need to integrate with automation because automation is here to stay and it's just going to, we're just going to see more and more of it. And then it needs to be part of your foundational journey as you move forward as a scientist in the lab recording what you're doing. Because at the end of the day, people are going to need to reuse the data that you produce. And that is the whole premise behind artificial intelligence and machine learning. But since I touched on ELN, I wanted to quickly touch on a LIMS uh, workflow. And the truth is the ELN and the LIMS uh, environments are starting to morph over time. And there are some companies out there, you know, doing this as we speak. But typically, uh, a LIMS is used in a more of a structured workflow, a, a more repeatable environment where you're registering, you're doing your date, your sample accessioning, you're registering them that you receive them, you're doing any necessary preparations, you're figuring out what the work allocation and the testing is, um, any validation that has to go on. Um, there, there could be cascade involved in here on the testing. So then you, you, you know, things may have to be retest, they have to get signed off on, and then the reports come and, um, and then you, you, know, you move on. But just so people understand that ELN today and LIMS do mean two different things, but they are actually starting to overlap. And it's really critical when you're doing your due diligence that you do not select the wrong tool for the job because you will, you will pay uh, a really bad price for that. So if we talk about the multi-omics environment, and um, the reason I'm doing this is because it'll tie together at the end here for the, the two talks. You're really doing hypothesis and knowledge gathering. You're designing scope. 
your therapeutic areas, your workflows, and your gain knowledge around all this. Again, there's a multitude of systems that are going to be required in your multi-omics environment. You're going to need a, uh, an ELN environment for sure. You're going to probably need a LIMS environment. You're going to need a sample management environment. Um, in your analysis comes along with your multi-omics platforms or along with it. And then the overall data management of that so that your data is fair uh, is really critical. So in large, medium to large biopharmaceutical companies that are um, establishing or have established multi-omics uh, um, efforts, you really are gonna have to get a handle on this because the amount of data being produced and it's high value data, um, but it's, it, it's only high value data when it's brought together properly and assessed by experts. So just, we have, you have to be pretty careful there. So the, the critical importance here is exponential increase of data, high throughput experimentation, quantitative measurements of many targets, DNA, RNA, protein, metabolite, lipidomics, epigenomics, genomics, you just go down the line. Um, Drug ability are the modes of action, biological pathway disruption, DNA and RNA. The impact of e efficacy, safety, and novelty is huge. Um, and so not only, like I mentioned before, high volume, high complex data, you have to make sure it's contextualized properly so that you can bring it all together in, the, in your steps of integration. Um, like previous drug discovery efforts, um, it's, it's critical to do this to further insight and discovery. Um, if you're gonna spend the effort and the money doing all this, you better get the biggest bang for your buck. Lots of challenges, the pipelines, the, from a data perspective, the fair, you're not fair compliant. You don't know how to archive this. You can't visualize it properly. You can't integrate. You can't pull the knowledge back out of it. Um, you've got individual silos and data sets. Um, and it's just, it's an issue. And the last thing you wanna do is step in, into this and not have the reproducibility of your science, not be able to find, access, integrate, and reuse your data. I mean, it would be really a shame at the, in the year 2020 if you step into a multi-omics effort and you can't do this today. And again, this is why I've, I've had uh, Dotmatics and Bluebee uh, on the call today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew and he's gonna walk through what Dotmatics has to offer um, from a drug discovery um, biology perspective. Thanks, John. Um, you can hear me okay? Yeah. So I always like being part of these webinars um, and talking with John because John always has very interesting topics and very broad topics. Um, and that's fun and interesting, but it also creates challenges for a speaker because there's so much you could talk about. Um, so next slide, John. So in preparing for this, I thought, well, I better just put some context around what it is that at least I want to talk about in my part of the presentation. So I, I came down in this, in this first part, at least, to the question, you know, what is biology and drug discovery? And, and I'll admit, this is our definition. You hopefully have something similar, but it could be a little bit different. For us, it's a really important question because we are, as an informatics provider, we're often asked the question, what software do you have for biology? And if we can't, that's a difficult question to answer because you don't really know what the person is asking about. So you need to provide some context around that. So I'm doing the same thing here. For me, I see three broad areas of biology and drug discovery. The first one is around target identification and validation. So this is where you're doing basic biological investigation, understand those basic processes so you can try and find and analyze and hopefully validate potential drug targets. Since this is more exploratory, we would, I use the term that this is more ad hoc type experimentation. Um, you're really starting from the concept of a clean slate, but I'll then come back and talk about that in a minute where it's not really the case. And of course, this is one of the features that this is applicable across all drug discovery, both small molecule and biologics drug discovery. And the second broad area is biologics drug discovery itself. And this is the area that I'm most focused on here at Domax. So one example, not the only, but certainly one example of this is research and development into novel biologics-based therapeutic entity types. And this has been a real feature of the industry over the last five to 10 years. 
Um, we've moved past the purview of just simple antibody, not simple, but pure antibodies and, and peptides into an ever broadening set of therapeutic types. And we'll, we'll cover those, I think, a little bit on the next slide. And again, this is more what we would refer to as ad hoc experimentation. This is discovery, understanding how we can create a new entity type that might access a new part of pharmacological space. Um, we can contrast that in biologic drug discovery with more standardized processes. So within most biologic drug discovery, at some point you're going to do protein expression and purification. Um, these are pretty standardized processes across the industry and particularly within a given organization, it's really important that we do this as consistently as possible so that we get the highest quality and most consistent purifications, both in terms of the ultimate samples that are produced and also conceptually understanding what it is we've done, um, where we're storing it, all those kind of informatics type uh, elements. And then the third part John talked about a little bit is around biology uh, referring to screening assays. Now, dogmatics, we, we tend to prefer to use the term screening or assays just for simplicity, but the term biology to mean screening is still widely used in the industry. And here again, we bridge across both ad hoc uh, experimentation when we're doing assay development, but once we've developed and validated our assays, we move into much more of a structured world because again, we want to repeat the screens as uh, repeatedly and, and consistently as possible. So we end up with the highest quality data and high quality data and the ability to make decisions from is something that John's already emphasized heavily and certainly is a big part of my presentation and, and our whole ethos at Dotmatics. Now for us, of course, what this means is that each of these activities drives distinct needs on our informatics solutions. Um, and so I'm going to cover some of how that comes through, particularly this sort of dichotomy between ad hoc and, and structured experimentation in the next few slides. Just before we get to that, that's more of a technology um, element. Here's more of a scientific element that creates challenges within biologic drug discovery. Um, as I said, um, it used to be kind of simple. We had antibodies, we had peptides, um, but now we've exploded into more types of entities. This is certainly not a comprehensive set, but it highlights just some of the features. We can take two perfectly good antibodies and we can combine them and create a bispecific antibody um, to create, to perform certain functions that we've, dictated, we've determined is valuable for us. Um, alternatively, we can take that antibody and we can attach a, a linker and a payload where the payload is a small chemical. And so now we have an antibody drug conjugate. And this becomes interesting because now we're not just in the world of biology, but we're in the world of biology and chemistry. And so that again, that places demands on our informatics system to understand both of those. Um, to the uh, right of the antibody, we see one of the really interesting entity types, so they're all, all interesting, but I'm particularly fascinated by the development of CAR T therapies. So here you take part of an antibody, you take a transmembrane region, you take a T cell activation intracellular region, you combine them into this kind of Frankenstein molecule that, you, that cells will express. And this really gets us into genuinely personalized medicine. If you're not familiar with what the CAR T's therapy is, I highly recommend you, you read more about that. And then, so we're not just in the peptide or protein world, of course, in the nucleic acid world, particularly around RNAs, we're seeing more type, different types of modified versions of RNA in particular. And again, this comes back to that point of, um, in order for, to make these viable therapeutics, we tend to have to chemically modify them in some way. So again, the requirement to support chemistry and biology becomes very important here. So that's challenges in the scientific uh, realm. Uh, next slide, John. We'll, we'll talk more about some of these, this dichotomy between ad hoc and structured um, workflows. And I'm, I'm putting this in the place in, in the scope of particularly electronic lab notebook here. Of course, these, these apply in other areas as well. So what does this mean in terms of some of the challenges and the features to meet those challenges? So if we consider first on the ad hoc side, so this is what I was referring to before about more scientific exploration. And again, we sort of think of it as a blank sheet of paper or a blank slate. And that's not really the reality, at least that's my argument, as we'll cover it in just a moment. But it's a nice way to start, right? Um, so in order to support this kind of experimentation, you've got, you're going to typically have more unstructured text input. So John had in his slide had 25% unstructured to 75. In these experiments, it, it may be more, a little bit more flipped the other way in this particular case, right? 
So unstructured text input. You're also going to have a lot of files that you're likely to want to attach to your experiment. Um, so instrument data files. Uh, you're probably going to have a bunch of Excel files. You may have other documents that support your experimentation. And so being able to attach those effectively and access them is important. And to try and reduce the number of Excel files you're attaching, having some sort of flexible tabular data capture within the system is also valuable because you want to have that data go straight into the database that makes it um, uh, adhere to those FAIR principles, particularly being able to be found again when you go ahead and search. And that's true for the attachments too. You want to try and parse those as much as possible so you can find them again uh, through searching, not just browsing. Um, so that's kind of these free form elements, um, but that doesn't mean that we can't place some structure in an ad hoc world. So um, all experiments, of course, have to have a purpose. Uh, otherwise, if we don't ask a question, we don't know what the answer is. So they need aims and hypotheses. Um, the more that we can have programmatic integration with registration and inventory systems means that we can um, understand what we use in the experiment, what was produced as part of the experiment, and where the, the physical samples go, where the concepts can go. Uh, so that's critical as well. Um, and also, because we're using more free text in these experiments, the more that we can use dictionaries and ontologies becomes really important, again, for standardizing as much as possible that text so that we can have consistency and we have the same concept referred to by the same thing and we can find them again. Again, it comes back to high quality data and findability. And finally, of course, um, as appropriate, we have to have formalized review, sign off, audit tracking, all those kind of things. That's what a system would need to do to support ad hoc. On the right hand side, then we can switch and see what would we need for more of a structured workflow. Um, here, we're going to have uh, much more of emphasis on integrated SOPs. We want to make sure that when we conduct the same experiment multiple times, we do it the same way. And John already had a webinar on reproducibility and the crisis there. And I, I recommend you. you watch that, it was very enlightening. Uh, with these structured workflows, there's gonna be much heavier emphasis on structured data capture. There's gonna be a lot of form fields. Science, scientists, particularly biologists, aren't always that fond of entering into, into those fields. So we're always looking for ways to further improve that, but it is a very effective way of capturing structured data. We're typically gonna have a number of tabs or something equivalent to guide users through the workflow. A really critical point that John already highlighted was the more that we can automate data capture from experiments directly into your digital system or your digital scientific system, the more that we can take humans out of the loop, um, the more that we can avoid um, inadvertent errors and it just speeds up the process overall. Likewise, um, that's more from uh, internal experiments, uh, instruments externally in these structured workflows, we often use CROs. So the more that we can have that CRO deposit the information directly into the ELN um, rather than emailing them or, or sending them in some other form that again speeds the process and leads to high quality information overall. And again, as John highlighted, um, looks like we're, we're in sync here, John, um, having integrated request systems is really important because in these structured workflows, there are typically part of the workflow is going to be performed by um, other groups. Um, and so being able to send those requests out, get information and, and have that the whole system um, monitored and, and controlled is very important. And of course, in these structured workflows, we have everything from the left-hand side as well. Right, so a lot of text on the slide. Um, next slide, John, let's, let's um, transition to some more, more interesting pictures. So I'm gonna talk about how this happens in the dogmatics sphere. Um, any other systems will likely have some, at least some equivalent concepts. Here we have what we term for, to support these uh, ad hoc, uh, exploratory type experiments, we have what we consider that we, what we call the discovery ELN as part of the dotmatics overall ELN. This is a configuration of the ELN. It's not a customization, or in other words, it's not coding. It's just a configuration, um, and then we will we can create other templates as a, as I show or will show you with different configuration, but again, not 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 coding, not customization. So in this case, we have an info tab. This is always necessary. We need to capture what the experiment was, just metadata about it. Uh, next slide, John. And then a couple of um, screenshots here where we uh, have uh, more of the emphasis on the ad hoc nature here. So we have a aims and methods uh, section. 
where the objectives of the experiment are entered as free text. Again, we want to use ontologies and dictionaries as much as possible here to control the vocabulary. And in the lower screenshot, you can see we have a, an image, a gel here, into the documents or attachments tab. Um, if we understand what the file type is, we can display a preview of it, as we see here. But in all cases, we capture the documents and, and link out back to them, either they're captured in the system or we link back to a, a source document. So, for example, if this were a genomics, you know, thinking ahead to Mike's talk, if this were a genomics data set, we wouldn't want to bring that in to the ELM, we would simply link out to it. So we could link out to the Bluebee system. Uh, next slide, John. So that's on the ad hoc side. How does this contrast with what we do on the more structured workflow? So again, what, we're, what you're seeing here is just a different configuration of the Dogmatix ELN. I've highlighted with that red bar in the middle, uh, upper middle there, some additional tabs that have been added into this configuration to guide the user through a protein purification workflow. So here, again, we, have aim, we always have aims and methods. Um, so that's the start of it. Um, next slide, John. But then here's where we start to have more structured data input. So in this first slide here, what we're looking at is guiding the user in this three-step process through collecting up all the materials that they're going to be using in this experiment. So we start on the left-hand side there, workflow step one. We have a form a field to select material type. When the user clicks that, they get what's shown in step two there. Um, this is a dialogue where they see all the various uh, materials that they might be able to use in the experiment. Um, they select first, in this case, cell line, and then that takes them to workflow step three on the right, where they can select one or more cell lines that they're gonna use within the experiment. The key here is they, in doing this workflow, they're accessing the registration system. So every, all of these cell lines are registered so that we have controlled data access or data entry into the ELN. It means that we know what we're working with. Subsequently, we could run a search and say, show me all the experiments where we use a given cell type or whatever material it was, and we can pull those back. So it's that, again, that concept of findability. Once the user selects whatever cell types they're going to use, they can just iterate over the whole process and select all the various materials until they have everything they need for the experiment, clearly in this very highly structured way. Uh, next slide, John. So that's pulling data from kind of the core underlying system, the registration system, into the experiment. They then run the experiment, and as part of this, they're going to create a purified protein. Now we need to, in a, again, in a structured way, um, capture what was what was created in the experiment. Of course, they're creating um, both the physical sample and also the concept, um, the representation of that sample, that purified protein. So within another tab of the system, they can click to register the purification. That brings up the dialog. You see the square one towards the middle there. Um, that confirms that, that uh, the, the, the expression was uh, registered. And then also highlighted there in the, in the red, red oval there, they have the option here to directly add the concept as a physical sample into the inventory system. So here's where they would um, specify uh, where in which freezer, in which lab or which building that sample, that physical sample is stored so that then um, they or, or anyone else can find it again. So we're not just talking about findable data, we're talking about findable samples as well. Right, so that, that just works through some of the, the, um, the, the variations in the ELN that support ad hoc versus structured experimentation. So next slide, John. Now, of course, capturing data is not an end of itself. It's just a means to an end where the, mean, where the end itself is allowing a scientist to find, gather up, aggregate, and get a comprehensive view of the data that they're going to use in their experiment um, so that they can make well-informed, timely decisions. And for us, we provide that capability through our product browser, which is really where Dotmatic started. And here you can just see a screenshot of an example project. So these, again, are configured views um, within a given type of project. This is an antibody drug conjugate, an ADC project. So you can see it provides the key information that a user is going to want to see. There's some summary information towards the upper left of the screenshot. Immediately below that, we see the chemical payload. So again, emphasizing that we're blending both chemistry and biology here. Um, further to the bottom on the left-hand side, we see some assay data. So we can assess the quality of this particular candidate. 
And on the right hand side, we have information about the antibody uh, part of the ABC. So we have um, uh, summary information at the top of the light and heavy chains and then details down below. The user can browse through these results or rather they, they start by searching for them um, for various criteria. It could be all the data for the project. It could be some specific data for the project as these drug discovery projects get larger, it becomes more critical that you can have a, um, an effective query and pull back the right sort of information. Next slide, John. So again, that's the, that's the key is pulling it all together and, and making informed decisions. So then my last slide here before I transition onto Mike um, and, and as by way of transitioning, I'm gonna pose another question here. So what is the role of genomics and drug discovery? And genuinely at Dotmatics, we're interested to hear from the other panelists and from the attendees about how they see this topic. Again, um, I like to just provide some definitions here. Um, genomics versus gene sequencing, obviously genomics, if you believe Wikipedia, refers to um, the study of the structure, function, evolution, mapping, and editing of genomes. Whereas gene sequencing, and, and these two terms tend to be a bit used interchangeably, but, but really formally they're different. Gene sequencing obviously is a technology and it's used within genomics, but it's also used in many other areas such as um, sequencing, antibody, candidate, I don't think many people refer to those as, to that as genomics. And in technologies such as DNA encoded libraries, we create a barcode for a small molecule or a set of small molecules and the volume of the data in a DNA encoded, DNA encoded libraries can easily be as big as those for uh, a genomic study. Application areas, um, examples of them, of course, for genomics and, and drug discovery around target ID and validation, around farm code genomics for personalized medicine, and then uh, additional precision or personalized medicine approaches for CAR-T, as I mentioned before, and other T-cell therapies. And here playing devil's advocate a little bit, the question I'd, I'd like to find out more about what other panelists think is, is genomics mainstream for drug discovery research organizations currently? And in fact, we can broaden that more to the same question for other omics and multi-omics approaches. We know some of the key challenges around data volume and complexity of the data, uh, around performing appropriate statistical analyses of the data, given the, the, the large data sets we're working with here. And then ultimately that leads to, can we effectively interpret the biology that the genomics type analysis or experiment is telling us? Those are all great questions, or hopefully they're good questions, they're my questions anyway, I hope, hope to get more insight into them. But the key point is that whatever you do, you have to come back to effective um, experimentation, well-formed hypotheses, and high quality data capture. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I think, so to summarize, Andrew, I think you're saying basically we need to eliminate people as much as possible from the entire process. And I'd agree with that. No, we, we, we need to repurpose the people to do more science and less manual data processing. Even better. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah. So, yeah. So in addition to the people, um, there's, there's a number of challenges throughout the entire workflow from experimental design through data analysis, interpretation. Um, but if we address these, you know, the value of the data gener generated, as John mentioned, can be really maximized. And even more so if the workflow is iterative where each experiment builds on uh, the prior experiment. Uh, this, uh, work, this iterative workflow here, plan, execute, analyze, integrate, and generate is kind of inspired from the paradigm of synthetic biology of design, build, test, learn. And I see SynBio and the influence of SynBio even moving more into uh, drug discovery and multiomics uh, workflows, you know, because it enables uh, really fundamentally understanding uh, the mechanisms that how biology is engineered um, or could be engineered. Right. Um, so, um, you know, in these iterative connected workflow, in this, and the value is even more um, uh, the, of the data is even more valuable where. Um, it's an iterative workflow um, where uh, the relevant data from the plan and execute stages is findable and accessible in the analysis stage and the integrate and generate stage. And it's in these later stages really where Bluebee lives. Um, and, but before I talk about that, I, I wanted to bring up something that initially really bugged me about biology is, you know, when I came to biology uh, from an engineering computer science background, and uh, 
but it's something that uh, I've come to embrace and really appreciate is kind of a beautiful challenge. And that is what I'll call squishiness, uh, the concept of squishiness. So, you know, over the years, I've heard biologists say that biology is squishy. And it wasn't in regards to the water content of cells or anything like that. But in regards to the precision of the analysis results, in more technical terms, this squishiness could be uh, referred to as statistical variation. And the sources of this variation can both be technical and biological. Uh, and with multi-omics projects that involve different types of analytes and greater numbers, both types of variation increase along with the bi biological complexity that you're looking to try to understand, uh, along with issues of organizing your data flows and computational scaling. But I'm, I wanna encourage us to not be intimidated by it. We need to identify it, capture it, quantify it, and incorporate these sources of variation into our analysis and our interpretation. And if we do these things, um, I think we're better positioned, uh, we are better positioned to unravel the complexity of the biology while also ensuring reproducible results. Um, and so uh, what are some of these challenges and keys to achieving this? Uh, well, that's what I'm gonna talk about for the next few minutes. So John, if you could go to the next slide there. Uh, so, but before you can, you know, really address the squishiness, uh, the relevant data needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. And for that to happen, your infrastructure, well, well, really beyond your infrastructure, your overall ecosystem that includes where your data and software tools live, your data practices, and even your philosophy should be aligned with uh, fair principles. And you should do this as soon as possible because if you take an, you know, an ad hoc approach to the analysis uh, piece of the puzzle here, uh, if, you, if you take the view that, oh, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, it's likely, going to be a very expensive toll bridge with terrible traffic. Um, so more specifically, what does this fair enabled multi omic ecosystem look like? Well, uh, it's probably gonna use open source tools, which is fine, it's the norm, but they really should be industrialized. And by that, I mean the inputs and outputs parameter values are well-defined, versioning is tracked, errors are caught, caught and logged. Uh, just because a tool completes running and generates output does not mean the results are valid. Uh, each of these tools and pipelines need to be benchmarked uh, against, uh, against controls. These could be public controls, commercial controls. They could come from a, uh, an effort like the genome in a bottle. Uh, they could come from those types of places, but they need to be benchmarked. Now, as I work for a born in the cloud solution provider, I'm admittedly biased. Uh, but in my opinion, pursuing fair data standards at scale is far more cost effective and time effective utilizing cloud-based resources as opposed to local high performance cloud or data warehouses, while also really providing you with a, the most future-proof uh, solution possible. Um, ideally, if your ecosystem is organized efficiently, you know, silos are minimized, you can't ever get rid of them entirely, with robust data provenance, and by that I mean, you know who did what, when and where, with all the nitty gritty meta, meta details uh, uh, as well. Every, you really have set yourselves up for a situation where every experiment can suggest the next experiment. And with the scale and number of sources of variation and non-obvious connections with multi-omics, uh, the next best hypothesis about which gene or pathway to target or the criteria for uh, a cohort uh, may be guided by an automated predictive model. Um, and, and finally, you know, the, uh, the ecosystem should be organized in such a way that all the roles, not just the technical experts within an organization can leverage that data. At Bluebee, we find it helpful to look at setting up this ecosystem with a holistic uh, business perspective, uh, not just solving an immediate technical problem. Uh, John, could you go into the, the next slide there? Um, so, um, breaking it down, uh, John, uh, you want to go on? Can we go? Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't working. Sorry. No, no. <laughs> I just was sure if I was uh, my audio might have gone out or something. So, breaking it down a little further, you know, this technical variation shows up in how we measure different analytes via sequencing, uh, PCR, mass spec, flow cytometry. It shows up across uh, and within different vendor platforms. Uh, uh, across sample and library prep protocols that we use in the wet lab. It shows up in the analysis pipelines, changes to the underlying tool versions and parameters, uh, even specific 
uh, compute resources can have an effect with some uh, for certain algorithms. Um, as an extreme example, uh, you know, I once saw different sequencing results, uh, sequencers results that turned out differently depending on the weather. It happens, uh, the sequencer happened to be a very tall building and lightning storms we found out, you know, after uh, weeks of troubleshooting could actually alter the results. It might've been actually months uh, before we figured it out. Um, so I'm not necessarily advising capturing the outside barometric pressure in your metadata, but in this case, if a machine learning model for identifying sources of variation had this metadata available, it would have stuck out like a sore thumb. You know, what's obvious to the unbiased model is not obvious to people. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, the metadata, you know, points directly at the source and sometimes it's a convenient proxy. But if it's not captured uh, first and accessible downstream, these non-obvious sources of technical variation may, you know, plague your, your project, especially if it's a large-scale multi-omics project. Um, so appropriately dealing with all these sources of uh, technical sources of variation, identifying and removing batch effects, you know, means capturing a whole lot of metadata and making it accessible to downstream uh, tools. Uh, then once these technical uh, sources of variation have been handled, the biological variation can be used to elucidate these very nuanced biological mechanisms of action without worrying about which lab, instrument, and protocol the samples were processed by. You know, why is the immune response different between these two samples that happen to have the exact same mutations? Oh, it's because the promoters in this one pathway are methylated, leading to different protein receptors on the surface. Uh, to be able to make these types of connections efficiently requires uh, an omics ecosystem that is analyte agnostic and capable of running any homebrew, open source, or commercial software, and or commercial software to achieve really what I'll call a best of breed solution. Because in my opinion, it'd be impossible to achieve this with a single uh, off the self solution. Uh, so why don't we move on to the next slide and talk about uh, the, uh, serving all the stages within, Ingle, within with a single ecosystem. And this may seem like taking on an unnecessary complication, like why making things harder than necessary, but there's tremendous value in doing so. You know, new insights and connections can and should be made during all stages, discovery, translational, clinical, but for various reasons, political, commercial, logistical, technical, regulatory, just plain unawareness, data often gets stuck in silos uh, within a particular stage where then it can't be leveraged to inform the other stages. And I really doubt this comes to news as anyone on this call, but it is indeed possible to architect an ecosystem where all these stages are really seamlessly interconnected and data silos are minimized. And when that happens, the value of the data is maximized by extending its lifespan, its reusability, uh, data is not just for one experiment or one project, it becomes a, a, a resource that can be used over and over again and help you not repeat experiments that have already been done perhaps somewhere else in your organization. Um, let's move on to the next slide and talk about uh, the challenges of working globally, which is certainly a challenge. Uh, particularly with multi-omics, data and collaborators can be scattered across the globe. Uh, and even across different organizations. And a natural byproduct of this is data silos and loss of metadata. Sometimes uh, this is required by regulations. Uh, when, the, when the issue is data residency, this issue can be addressed by sending the tools to the data uh, uh, where the data lives. So it, does, it can stay within a particular locality. Uh, and then with anonymized data and metadata flowing back to a repository where it can be aggregated. Uh, Though doing so requires a global granular, granular management capabilities, uh, which once again allow the value of the data to be and its lifespan to be maximized. Uh, why don't we move on to the next one? So technology, you know, never stops. You know, cloud resource providers offer a dizzying array of options and never-ending updates for data management and analysis. Um, however, you know, putting together a distributed, modular, future-proof platform that enables best-of-breed solutions at the right level of abstraction for science-focused organizations can require several years and literally tens of millions of dollars to, uh, to develop. Um, why don't we move on to uh, the next one? Um, 
And if you had any doubts about the value, you know, uh, of this data, this global data, just look at the number of regulations that, you know, are put around it. Um, and to be, get the most value out of this globally connected data, your systems and practices need to abide by these regulations. But with a modular, you know, with a modular software and infrastructure architecture that can be readily adapted to meet security and compliance requirements, it's possible with the central orchestration platform to essentially, that will essentially act like an operating system atop a vast global pool of growing third party cloud resources uh, to do things like send the analysis tools to the data. Uh, and this is where, you know, Bluebee comes in. So when we move on to the next slide, uh, and uh, that's essentially the platform that Bluebee has built and continues to build and invest in. Um, with the underlying complexity abstracted away, our partners really experience this ecosystem through four components at a level that is most meaningful to them. Uh, Blueflow is the component used for building and delivering industrialized pipeline for any flavor of omics, regardless of type of analyte. Bluebase is our big data solution for extracting and aggregating key content and metadata from pipeline results and third party data sources, such as including, but not limited to LIMS and ELNs. Uh, and Blue Bench provides our partners with data science notebook and dashboarding capabilities for uh, interactively exploring, visualizing their data, as well as creating new industrialized machine learning tools that can be used to then extend their Blue Flow production pipelines. And this is kind of, we're, we're striking the same balance that Andrew was talking about in terms of having a framework that, uh, a, a, that supports rigorous, uh, uh, it's it's rigorous in terms of, but it also allows uh, flexibility to uh, work with uh, your data. Um, and for me, you know, this is really the the opportunity, you know, where exciting innovation can happen with with all that upstream data and analysis results at your fingertips, and the data is in a query and compute ready format. It's been parsed out of the files. Uh, it's not contextless, so you don't you know where it came from, who produced it, and the and the surrounding information about it, why it was generated. Um, you know, and nearly limitless compute resources available. It's uh, really possible to establish a very rich multi-omic biological context where machine learning tools can then suggest the next hypothesis to the to test. This could be the form of cohort selection, gene pathway tar gene or pathway target identification or uh, even both in parallel. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Blue Vantage, which is our web framework for making the, a productized version of these innovative workflows available to non-bioinformaticians, non-data scientists, these could be clinicians, these could be other researchers, um, uh, in a robust, uh, user-friendly way. And that's where the real impact and value is felt when these components are used together in concert. Um, together, along with an ELN and a LIMS, you know, it, it's, it creates a very efficient ecosystem for establishing, maintaining data provenance, uh, which is necessary to capture, identify, and remove uh, technical variation so that biological variation can confidently be leveraged uh, for gaining new insights and ensuring reproducible workflows. Uh, and so uh, to wrap up, um, uh, we can go on to that next slide there. Um, I really believe we're poised to start realizing the benefits of multi-omics uh, multi approach to accelerating our understanding of biology and, and many different areas of biology. Um, but you know, to, uh, to do so, you need to address the technical variation uh, and, uh, and then at that point you can leverage, uh, the biological variation for, for, uh, new insights. Uh, and in terms of just the blocking and tackling, you need to capture and connect that data and metadata across all stages efficiently, minimize the silos. Uh, can't be intimidated by, don't be intimidated by the scale of the computation that's required. Uh, don't let regulatory constraints, uh, you know, uh, prevent you from collaborating globally um, and you know make sure you have an ecosystem where your wet lab scientists your data scientists your bioinformaticians are really empowered uh, 
to you know uh, focus on the science and not be worried about the infrastructure and the plumbing required uh, for your data. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so we have some folks that have some hard stops at the top of the hour. Th this will go till uh, half past the hour if uh, if folks uh, want to stay on. Just so you know, um, we're ready for Q and A. We're going to have some of the panelists discuss some of their experiences, etc. So the the first one is Josh. Josh, are you still on? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Josh, you, you know, you just got to hear all this and you're, you're one of our awesome panelists. What are some of the challenges that you face? Um, and I know I have it up on the screen here, but you can talk to this. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to talk through it. Um, right, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a biologist by training and, uh, and you know, a scientist at heart. And so I think I really uh, uh, feel for, for, what our, for what our researchers are going through on a day-to-day -day basis when they're interacting with these tools. Um, I think there's a couple of things that, that we've experienced at NGM, right? As a biologics organization with a, a very kind of heavy uh, impact on R&D, um, one of the main things that we've kind of uh, uh, taken on is this kind of cultural challenge of, of helping our scientists get a, you know, comfortable with using electronic lab notebooks, other informatic systems. I need to remember, unlike chemists who have been doing this for 20 years now, biologists are, are still pretty new to the ELN kind of idea, and a lot of them are still, have been using paper notebooks for a long time. So just getting them to the point where they're comfortable uh, working with these systems and, and realizing the benefits of these systems uh, has been a, a, a real challenge that we faced. Um, yeah, and by the way, that, that, that what you just pointed out, I w I'm old enough to be there when the chemists were starting to get their tools in the very beginning. Yeah. And um, there were knockdown drag out fights. I mean, the, the change management that has to happen um, is real. And it's biology's turn now to start um, you know, kind of falling in line and adopting. I, I will tell you, if you went into somebody today that's had an ELN, a mature ELN for years, and said, "Hey, we're going to take it from you," you, they, you know, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be a fight. And the point that's I'm right. trying to make is, people weren't ready to adopt them when they came, but they're not. They would not let them go at this point either. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and part of that reason is, right, and Andrew touched on this nicely, right? These new, these new ELNs are becoming so customizable and, right, and the, and the ability for us to really adapt them to be functional to each individual user or each individual group's uh, needs has been really, I think, uh, a, a nice thing going forward, especially for a, a smaller company like NGM, where we're not gonna be going and paying for new software, you know, to be designed or new, or new, new like, uh, customizations to be done. Um, so these, the flexibility that's intrinsic in these uh, solutions has been really, uh, you know, beneficial to us. Um, right. I, thought, I thought I'd touch on the, the bioinformatics and multi-omics side a little bit uh, because I am in the bioinformatics capacity. Um, and, you know, I think the, 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 the Bluebee kind of uh, conversation was, was, was a really nice one, right? And what we found is that the actual analysis of this data, and we do everything from, you know, RNA-seq, DNA-seq, single-cell RNA-seq, um, we're doing all these analyses. The analysis isn't particularly challenging. Those workflows are pretty well defined these days. Um, the challenge is really lies in the biological interpretation of those data, that last step, and really making sure we make the most out of those complex data. And the fact is you give a biolog any biologist or most biologists a spreadsheet with lots of numbers on it, and it's going to be extremely overwhelming, right? And so we've had a lot of success in those kind of developing those internal web applications and other visualizations to give our scientists really a, a comfortable way to interact with that data so they can get to that next level and really start making biological interpretations that facilitates that next experiment or that or the next hypothesis. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, and, and sorry for having to jump off here. Oh, no, it's not, no problem. Um, Nitty, you have some sli a couple slides that you wanted to cover too. Yeah, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, so John, first of all, thank you for uh, you know making me part of uh, this interesting forum, and, and I also kind of want to echo Andrew's uh, comments earlier that uh, John does like all of these exciting stuff, and uh, you know for me it's kind of like really fun to just be part of these things. So John, I'm just here to have some fun. Um, so when John reached out to me and said, "Nitty, uh, would you like to be a panelist on this?" And, uh, and I started sort of thinking about biology and, uh, you know, chemistry and uh, because of my background, you know, kind of like dabbling in different spaces. Um, 
I think this is really sort of one of the things that came to, you know, my, my sort of, you know, um, head and my thought process is like, you know, middle in a haystack or, you know, the haystack itself. Because for me, it's about, it was about like, what are we doing here? You know, are we, are we like looking at the haystack or are we trying to find a needle? And I was just like Googling on the, uh, you know, like the whole, uh, you know, needle in the haystack uh, paradigm. And uh, I came across this artist and uh, apparently, you know, this artist, uh, you know, does these um, uh, artistic uh, endeavors and uh, he tries to find uh, a needle in the haystack. And apparently, you know, he's done one where he found a, a, a needle in the haystack in 24 hours. So I would say that, you know, um, sometimes like, you know, I, and maybe all the time art inspires science. Um, I would be very curious if, uh, you know, some of our colleagues, uh, product management teams who are on the call, they may want to actually ask this artist, right? I mean, what is it that this guy was up to and what his approach was and how he made it happen in 24 hours and all the artistic philosophy behind it. Um, next slide, please, John. Um, Another thing I, I kind of, you know, felt was, uh, you know, just the connections and the connections we have in the industry, the connections that exist within our biopharma organization, and, uh, you know, just connections in general. And, uh, you know, we always, like, there's this concept of six degrees of separation, and people are separated from each other by six degrees. And I was just curious, right? I mean, because we have things like, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so many other social media uh, platforms. And I was like, you know, is it still a six degrees of separation? And I came across this interesting um, research from Facebook, uh, which was, I think, published, looks like 2015. And uh, they basically, you know, said that, no, you know what? It's, it's not even six degrees. It's like, you know, three point four, six people. And it's, I, I'm just like, you know what, this is just Facebook research, right? I mean, what if it is combined with research, uh, which is Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know, like, you know, other uh, sort of uh, tools and technologies which are there to connect people. So I'm sure like this 3.46 number is, is actually going to get even smaller. And yeah. for me, like, you know, connections always drive, you know, communication, relationships, and uh, in you know in a in a scientific world that is really really important. So 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 for me like there's hope and you know there's like all of this like good stuff when it comes to just having access to people you know who think like you and who would like to do things that you would like to pursue. Um, next slide and I think that's my last slide. Uh, again, I, I will not go into specifics of uh, any of, you know, these, these things that I, I called out here. I'm going to keep it at a very high level. And, uh, uh, you know, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to sort of go into that. Um, write data and metadata. I mean, we do say these things and we do talk about these things, but there's just so much, you know, kind of, I would feel like, you know, there's this context to it in a way, when I say write data and metadata, it's not just about, you know, what is it that you're collecting and how you're defining it. Um, one of the things, again, you know, as part of today's conversations, right, I mean, when we, when we start saying things like taking human out of the loop, uh, I think we need to be very careful, right, I mean, to me, uh, right, I mean, that's sort of like this metadata aspect of it um, and how we are saying things. Um, I, I feel like, you know, there, there has to be some, um, you know, thought that goes into, you know, when this human is taken out of the equation, right, what value is being provided to this human? And, and I think that's kind of where, you know, the, the, to me, like the metadata comes in even from that perspective, just, you know, having that sort of mindset and having that mindset of, you know, change management and actually making feel people feel, you know, that they're still doing science, they're doing science, but they are getting this value out of this, uh, this whole process that, you know, that is going to enhance like their scientific journey. Um, for me, right and timely analysis, again, kind of goes back to 
you know, not just, you know, things being integrated and, uh, you know, being, being available and, you know, which is like all the good stuff that Ruby and Dotmatics both, you know, talked about. Um, I think to me, it's, it's, it's also about, right, I mean, um, you know, the, the connections, you know, that actually need the information and also, you know, just in terms of, you know, the, um, uh, really like the need of the hour in a way sometimes. And uh, I, I worked with Gilead and as you know, you know, we've been kind of on a, on a journey this year, uh, re really like beginning of this year. And, uh, and I kind of feel like some of the things, right, I mean, that we achieved could not have been achieved, uh, you know, without, you know, that right and timely analysis really, and having like, like that eye uh, on, on, on the ball in some way. Um, Last but not the least, you know, information sharing and collaboration at scale. To me, information sharing happens, right? I mean, we, we obviously have observed silos and, uh, you know, people have talked about it on this forum that, you know, um, it's, it's always kind of, kind of like making sure that, you know, we, we have the tools and technologies to, to share the information. But I think for me, it's not, it's not just about like information sharing uh, in terms of tools and technologies. But it's scaling things, right? I mean, um, how do you actually do collaboration at scale? I mean, we have all these different players in the scientific uh, uh, industry right now, right? I mean, there, there are the tools and technology players. There are CROs. There are big biopharma sponsors like us. And then, you know, there, there are regulatory agencies, right? Um, the, 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 whatever sort of we put in place, right? I mean, it has to be with, with that type of a mindset that this, this collaboration needs to happen at scale. It's not, you know, just like connecting, you know, one thing with the other, but the entire landscape and it has to be, you know, really like thought about in that way. Um, and again, like collaboration at scale for me is, you know, things like, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn and, you know, and Amazon, right? I mean, how like they are really like doing these things and making these things happen. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say today. And uh, well, thank thanks, you, Nitty. John, again. That was good perspective on things. Definitely some um, some opportunities to go deep on on some of the your thoughts and comments. Um, Yan Ping. So first of all, John, thank you for this opportunity. This is really fun. Sure. I, I enjoyed the, everybody's uh, presentation and Nidhi, I think that you highlight, I echo what you said as well. And I think John, in the beginning introduction, you already highlighted what I'm going to go a little bit detail. So I highlighted some challenges, it's real life experience. So I've been in pharma for more than 20 years. I was at Amgen, I was at AstraZeneca, now I was at Regeneron kind of highlight the real life experience. Um, I think Josh was, you know, bringing up the culture change. People don't accept the ELN. They, they love their paper notebook. So I have here in the picture of a uh, data jail. Um, there are two things got locked in uh, in the jail. I have the lab notebook, which is, you know, people who hold on to their lab notebook and say, no, you don't touch it. I love it. Don't take it away. And another way actually move a little bit further from that, we do have EON and people move to EON. Actually, they move a little bit away, a little bit one step away from the paper notebook, but go to the EON, what we call the uh, paper on glass. Um, it's, it's kind of a, still a jail. It's, a, it's very challenging to get the data out. So a few things I want to share with you where the data jail, my experience, where it come from. Uh, it come from. One thing is, you know, from the vision, uh, from IT informatics vision perspective, we implement a lot, uh, there are times we implement system uh, just for the sake of, you know, we need the EO and we, we focus on the functionality of, you know, you should be able to capture the method, you know, data, but didn't really thinking about data, like what really that means. So data centricity. Um, another thing is that um, the, the when we implement the systems that we a lot of times just focusing on data input you know we need to do data entries so the ELN template you know you configured the template and you start to put all this data there but didn't pay attention to look at and say how do what data do I need to take it out and how do I take it out what kind of business decision this data will drive to so 
that was time, the times when you implement ELN template or ELN uh, uh, projects, it was not a lot of effort put into it. Um, another point I want to make is that uh, for to really get the metadata, the contextual data for the, the you know the, that stored in ELN, you really need to model that. Should, you know the system is configurable, but doesn't replace the the effort. You need to think what are the business domain, what's the domain uh, model should be look like, and and put that into consideration when you implement systems like ELN. And without that, you lock the data, you kind of tend to lock the data into the system. And the last point is the, uh, I think both, uh, all, the, all the speakers touch on the point that to have a reference architect and data standards, the control vocabulary so that, you know, you have some standards. Next Those one. Those are great points. <laughs> I, hopefully, I have a lot of slides. Maybe I'll stop some point. Um, so this is like an old argument of configuration versus customization. And um, I know that, you know, from both the vendor side, you know, with the systems are configurable and from the internal, you know, the within the in, uh, IT organization within pharma, the goal is not to customize, you know, to minimize customization. But the, the reality is that there's tremendous level of customization to you know my experience um, and the, the 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 support maintenance support is a huge effort it's a it's a great portion of the IT cost and another thing is that limb systems and the question is how many limbs do you need I also I, I, I'm curious because at any given the organization I have been you have like in average more than seven limbs um, implemented and and they're still constantly looking for limbs you know they still need to get more limbs and another reality is that system version upgrade is costly John you probably know what I'm talking about a system uh, version upgrade can take years absolutely <laughs> so the next one I will touch a little bit on the data processing analytics so, um, you know, our scientists should be uh, focused on doing the experiments and to discover and develop drug products. But this is, I think of the number I put here, 20 to 50% of our time uh, on data processing, formatting and manipulation. This is really, really low. I think the reality is higher than more than 20 to 50%. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, Yanping, I experience uh, in all my, uh, w you know, we call it data wrangling up to 80% in some organizations or some verticals within organizations. So it's pretty bad. It's huge. And and this process, is, first of all, it's not re repeatable. So for one experiment, they may, you know, manipulate data this way, another experiment right. may come back different ways. And so I highlight a step, for example, for people who are using ELN today, they copy and paste the data from instrument, you know, the output from instrument, and they copy and paste into ELN. And then they go ahead and copy and paste, you know, um, into the Excel, and then they do a, a analysis in the Excel. And then they also, there are times actually the, they, you know, put the data into Empower and then copy out from Empower. So there's a lot of a copy and paste from system to system and they create very complicated uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets with the, all the data, the raw data, process data, and they analyze. So it's huge effort. There's great opportunities there to help the, with the scientists. Um, when, when I reach out to the scientists and ask them, I said, do you want to do analysis across studies experiments and and everybody jump into and say yes you know without hesitation yes and then but then the giving the tools and the systems we have today actually this is a pretty challenging it's it's a stewardry um fair data this this fair data i think um, in it we talk about fair data but the awareness and the culture within the scientific community i think it's to be established it's not they don't have this awareness. Uh, so the last point I want to make is uh, from the business process perspective, um, when you get the strong support from the business stakeholder, and that's a starting point to looking at engineering work, work with them on the process improvement. Uh, when you have the buy-in and the support from the business stakeholder, 
when you you know really engineer the future process, uh, you know that it's a great success to your project. And I want to highlight that so I have done that once, and it was uh, it's great effort at the beginning, but it makes the project much more smooth after that. I think that's all the points I want to bring that. Well, thank you very much, Yan Ping. Uh, Shatora, did you want to add to any of what you've seen today or some of the feedback by your colleagues, et cetera? Yeah, it's actually very interesting to kind of hear everyone. We're, we're a small company, we're about 25 people, but right. um, our footprint externally is large. So we have yeah. uh, probably double the size externally. So the way we function is we, we, we develop assets, we kind of do the thinking in-house and we kind of externalize any weekly screening, any kind of big bulk chemistry externally. So thinking about getting data in and everything is very interesting hearing folks. So we've actually, um, our data, everything is handled externally. And uh, one of our goals have, was to minimize the amount of time folks take to analyze their data. So on a weekly basis, I spent, we, we get, you know, we, we don't get huge sets of data, but we run a couple of assays on a weekly basis per project. And on average, my time uh, curating the data and pushing that into the database is about 15 minutes at most. Um, it's mostly because we get, uh, we, when we source our software, we kind of look, we took our time getting it. And especially if we're looking at our data analysis software, we can build business rules into it. So to answer some of the questions, okay, one person analyzes the data in a certain way. Some people analyze data in a different way. We kind of got rid of that and got the data, the software itself to color code certain um, data types based on, okay, if it's a bad slope, give it a red color, if it's a bad X, so that even the external users can easily kind of um, curate the data for it. And when it comes back to us, we just do a quick look-see, check some Z primes and kind of push that into the database. So that's the approach we took. And, and it, again, we don't have the, well, we have a few people, it's easier to kind of wrangle them and take, <laughs> take care of everything. But as we grow, I think I kind of, Thanks to some of the panelists, I can actually keep an eye on a few things. Um, we started informatics from day one, so we haven't. We don't see too many problems. Um, every single sample we have is barcoded, you know, cell lines, proteins, DNA, RNA, whatever it be. So we have inventory systems that track it, so people can go find it. So we kind of again, I've learned from colleagues from larger companies to see what their pain points were, and when we started this company, we kind of address those probably from I think, I think though you experienced some of those pain points in your previous lives too. Yes, so, I definitely I mean. did, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah, we're not going down that road again, right? No, so, no, yeah. definitely not. So but right. I think one of our biggest things is a, is a all-in-one ELN. When I, when I say that ELN we have now is amazing, but it's very chemistry focused. So when yeah. I try to get my biologist on board, they they it was very high activation energy to get right. them on board. So we actually brought some consultants in and uh, developed some uh, templates for them so that they can kind of ease. This is a, it. this is a critical point. This is really important. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm um, uh, consulting for some uh, larger customers that are looking to go to, um, you know, replace their current ELN footprint. And I've, I've, I've said, look, I can't tell you what to do, but if you can, if you can choose one ELN that does chemistry and biology well, without boiling the ocean, that's your best choice. You know, it's a, it's a, because of some of the things that Andrew is talking about, like you're going to have that merging of chemistry and biology in many of these companies because they're doing ADCs. They're doing a lot of these um, hybrid chemistry, biology, um, initiatives, et cetera. So, um, but that's, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, I think if anything, I think Dotmatics comes closest to having something pretty good. Uh, we use ArcSpan, which is amazing in terms of chemist chemistry. Right. Um, but then we brought in Benchling for molecular biology tools. And then my bio biologist got wind of their notebook and they're like, well, can we switch? But we cannot right. let them switch because all our data is in one, one set. So got it. They, we, got we're it. just using something as a plugin to get stuff like primer design, kind of all of that handled, but then we have to maintain uh, one ELN. Now I, I push back on the vendors we have, I was like, look guys, can you just give us one easy solution we can use? But 
here what we did was we actually went in my sense what I call best in breed. So we, we have different software for every, every niche need. So we have uh, one thing to analyze our data, a different ELN, something else to use um, to visualize our data. And we put to, we got uh, a single sign on uh, uh, web interface to kind of, um, so that people don't have to remember multiple passwords. So when they log into their computer, Chrome launches, they click on what they need. And on the back end, we have a single sign-on interface that just logs them into which, whichever software. They need. Right, so. right. Interesting. Yeah, I think um, I haven't seen any questions come in. So if anybody sees any, just, just let me know. But I think the importance that I experienced as head of IT um, and, you know, coming, starting from the bench, working all my way all the way up to the top is that um, you really need to bring together the solution space. So at being able to have a company or an offering from Dotmatix work seamlessly with Bluebee is really important because, again, you have researchers and scientists in these spaces that wouldn't have a notebook otherwise, right? And so where are they keeping track of their work, et cetera? Um, you know, are they in a diagnostic space where maybe they're heavily limbs driven? But e even in these areas, you still have some development work going on. You still have things where people need to keep track of what they're doing. You know, it's it's company IP, but more than that, it's, it's or along with that, it's it's that reuse of the data. It's that reproducibility of the science. All the things that are really, believe it or not, it's 2020 and we're still struggling with um, today. Um, getting back to the, you know, not eliminating humans out of the picture, but not have humans doing work that's not bringing benefit to um, science or the organization. I have I had to deal with people that were used to physically walking samples up two flights of stairs every day. And that was their, the main part of their job. And they were PhD science and scientists and, and things. And, you know, they did it for such a long time that they got so comfortable with, you know, that the social aspect of it and this and that. But at the end of the day, you have to sit back and question what, what value is that bringing the company? What value is that bringing you as a, as a human, as a scientist, et cetera, et cetera? So yes, all those things are important, but maybe not to be your sole uh, objective in your role in a, in a you know, biopharmaceutical company. So, so a lot of change I think is coming. Um, I think uh, Bluebee and Dotmatix did an awesome job on their presentations. I thought the panelists did a great job. Uh, Yan Ping really summarized things. Nitty was bringing a different perspective on things and bringing almost like a, 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 a realism to it. So it was great. Um, and Josh got to, uh, and Shatora got to kind of give their, their backgrounds. Is there any questions you have for anybody on the call today? And it can come from a panelist too. It doesn't have to just come from yeah, one, one thing I'll add is um, yeah. when, when Ping was talking about that copying and pasting of data and uh, touching, taking an Excel file uh, and, and uh, entering data multiple times in multiple places, you know, back when my limbs days, I had a principle, a maxim that, you know, data should only be ever touched by a human really once or zero times, zero <laughs> times that it can be derived from someplace else. And if you're, and regardless of how many systems you have, if they're all yeah. accessible and interoperable, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many systems you have. And I think the best of breed approach is the right one to take, whether you need one limbs or two limbs or one ALN or, how, or informatics. But if you've got people, you know, manually, uh, you know, touching the data, doing some process that could be automated or could be derived from uh, some other, you know, more stable, uh, scalable mechanism, you know, uh, that that's an opportunity for improvement, you know, not right. just for efficiency, but cost and reproducibility. Because anytime humans are taking, copying and pasting, things get left off, things get left behind. Habits are very powerful. You know, we all, you know, uh, and we have to be aware that some of these, you know, habits, even though we're fine doing them, aren't necessarily optimal, part of an overall optimal solution. Yeah. Great. Totally agree with you. That's a, you know, there's huge opportunity. It's uh you know I've been a scientist 
in the, my past life is you know seeing them you know scientists spend time just just on spreadsheets tremendous of time on spreadsheets it's a uh, it's heartbroken yeah right and a big company that I think you know, that have existing legacy systems are in a mm -hmm. more difficult spot than young companies that are uh, true you know, are, that's very sorry, true it's yeah. always easier to just to take lessons learned uh but it is possible yeah it, yeah it, 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 it takes a cultural effort and i think one of the things right. is there's a disc between the leadership who sees this inefficiency and the biologists who have the day-to-day, week-to-week pressures of doing labs, performing assays, getting results, uh, and that culturally it's a, it's good. It's hard to because it's a long. It can be an existing a long-term process to adopt and implement these systems where the scientists are under day-to-day -day pressures. Yeah, it's very difficult. I can tell you from experience, it's very difficult to untie somebody else's knot right yeah. that's real tight and you're like i'm just going to go past this knot and so there, there's all all types of things come into play there's a question from jamie about what percentage of budget is generally spent to improve productivity for an r d team this is a great question and i don't know if i have if there's a single answer anybody can chime in here i mean i can tell you that um if the business and makes up their mind that they want to spend money to improve productivity they're going to do it right but that's the challenge the business is so um in such a fast-paced mode to go and discover that next new drug that they actually ha sometimes have to slow down to go and change the productivity sometimes they'll do it in a splinter project where they can use that that new project to change your productivity to come back and change others but um it, what percentage? I mean, uh, it's in the sometimes it's in the single digits, from my opinion. I don't know if anybody else on the call has an answer to that. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you that I've been, I've got to be careful. With, so I can tell you that, let's just say an order of magnitude, I had, we had a one, we had a, one trillion dollar budget in that's stupid we had a one billion dollar budget in r d right um i can tell you from an it spend perspective that that um that spend was a fraction of that budget and the point i'm trying to make is that it and the business in today's world in today's industrialized science world are a team and they really can't go at this separately. They have to go at this in a unified force and it's gonna take money. But, but then again, you really need to get the return on investment and you won't get the return on investment if you don't do the change management and all the things that, the things that we talked about in this call and the previous calls. If you do not do them, you're at high risk for not getting a return on investment. There is no value in deploying an ELN and, and keeping it paper on glass forever and you can't find things in it or whatever. It's just not a, a, a wise choice. You have to put the effort in to make them very usable, to make sure the data is high quality in, high quality out, it's fair, et cetera, et cetera. Because in the end, the artificial intelligence machine learning initiatives will give you up to 40% efficiency gains. And that's, that's phenomenal. And that's what, uh, all the large companies need. Um, what is the best, most honest process of assessing the needs of an ELN template to include the potential downstream needs of data consumption and how do you realistically balance that with more immediate needs of the analyst data entry? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Andrew, do you wanna, you wanna answer that? Yeah, I mean, this question actually basically defines what how Dotmatic started and that um, I mentioned in my part of the presentation that we started with this product browser. Um, the scientific founders of Dotmatics back in 2005 are still the CEO and CTO, um, Steve Gallagher and Alistair Hill. And they were working at time at a Merck facility in the UK. And they basically were, were addressing this problem of, you know, just what Yang Ping was saying is the data gets locked in these data jails and don't, data silos and um, I think that you know, to cut the story short because I know we are short of time but I think you really just have to focus there's a natural inclination there, there has been a natural inclination in the 
in the informatics in industry that you first have to capture the data, then you get to use it, right? You can't use the data if you haven't captured it. And so, so I think software vendors took this approach that, well, first of all, we need to develop a product that allows us to capture the data. And the software developers went off and created that. And then they said, well, okay, we'll capture the data now. Let's have, how can we use it? And what was realized is that many of the first generation ELNs, just there was really no concept. I mean, the data was stored in, you know, image PDFs and things, you can't really get it out of you and, and lots of other things. So um, I think that the, the answer to the, the question is, you really have to focus, there's no shortcuts, I think you just have to focus on how you intend to use the data, how, how it, either as a small project or as a, in, in the large scale within the, the organization. And that drives, that's essentially the, the question that you're asking. And then the answer to that is, is defining that, that template that allows you to create the right, to, to capture the right data in the right way um, and put it in the right way so it allows it to be um, accessed later. So it's all those fair type principles. It's the, uh, what, what everyone's been saying about the more automated data generation to relieve the scientists of those tasks and let them actually spend their time being scientists rather than data manipulators. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not a quick fix, yeah. but it's a critically right. important fix. Uh, and I would add to that too. So you know, sometimes the best way to, to nail this is to start backwards. So your, your, your question around the potential downstream needs, I would investigate those needs. You know, what, go talk to your computational chemists and biologists, et cetera. Find out from the data science team how they may be taking data out of the ELN, right? This is, this is a critical one. How are you mining your ELN today and what's working and what's not working? because that'll give you some great answers on how you should be building your templates. Get their input, because I can tell you as somebody who used to do that work, um, it's frustrating when the basic things are missing or you can't stitch things together because people just didn't care about or didn't know enough to, to figure out which metadata or what data to capture. So really engage your, your, your community. You've got consumers, which are those, a lot of times those folks, and you've got your producers. Sometimes your producers are your consumers also, but find out your consumer producer balance and find out who they are and ask them the, th the difficult questions. So thanks, that was a good question, Michael, thank you. And automate the heck out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I was all right, we're, we're over time, which is not a bad thing, but if, uh, let me see, we still got a bunch of people on. If anybody wants to ask a question, I'll give you like 10, 15 seconds. All right, I think we're, we're wrapping it up here. I just wanna thank everybody. I thought this was a great call, uh, a great webinar. Everybody was great and, um, the future's bright, there's a lot going on, and I really look forward to working with all of you in some capacity. So thanks again for all your efforts, um, your honesty, and your ability to, to get up here and talk about these things and uh, make it happen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank, Thank you. you all. All right, take care, stay healthy, Bye. stay safe. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.